All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the NAPSIX Foundation's Prep Tech Talk, the Indoor Frontier, exploring emerging technologies for first responders in the indoor environment. My name is Kevin Kay, and I am the Director of State and Local Programs. I will be walking you through the facilitation of this Prep Tech Talk today. So why are we here today? Well, we're going to talk about how first responders are going from command boards, paper maps, command on the hood of a truck, to something like this, where you have geo-reference maps, heads-up displays and smart helmets, real-time tracking and situational awareness, and turn-by-turn -turn navigation indoors. We aren't saying that the tried and true methods are going away, just that more agencies will be able to leverage this technology in the coming years. The key for public safety is to make sure the transition is seamless and available to all. As always, we'll get some quick housekeeping out of the way. As far as objectives, we want you all to gain a better understanding of the common challenges and solutions associated with indoor mapping, tracking, and navigation. We also have some use cases on how this technology is being used and advancing. And finally, we will talk about the best practices guide for indoor mapping, tracking, and navigation that you will have an opportunity to contribute to. Some of the topics discussed today are supported by NIST, Public Safety Communications Research Division through their Public Safety Innovation Accelerator Program. So we wanted to let folks know about that. Here's a quick rundown of the agenda. We'll get obviously some housekeeping items out of the way. For those of you that have attended one of these before, you know that we're gonna do a quick hands-on exercise. We're gonna have some use cases from Phil Milky and Suki Lama. Uh, they're going to show you some really cool technology, and then I will cover the best practices guide, and then we'll end with some Q&A. So obviously, nowadays with Zoom and web conference security, uh, all the attendees are muted. Uh, please use the Q&A function uh, if you want to ask questions of myself or any of the presenters today. And as always, uh, we will address Q&A at the end for the questions we don't get to. All the slides and resources shown today will be available. We'll send out an email with the link and they will be hosted on the NAPSIG website. Um, so again, that's what we have. But quickly, uh, for those of you that are new to our Prep Tech Talks, and this is your first NAPSIG Foundation event, I encourage you to explore our website. Uh, in short, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization established in 2005. And our vision is a nation of emergency responders and leaders equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcome for survivors. You can see we have over a 20,000 member network made up of public safety leaders, first responders, and GIS practitioners. And how do we do it? Well, we do everything from defining and promulgating consistent best practices through guidelines and standards. We're gonna talk about some of that today when we talk about the best practices guide. We're going to foster regional collaboration through implementation, normally through exercises, sandboxes. We build capacity in using innovative technology with education and training. You could find some of those resources on our website. And finally, we do knowledge transferring and skills via tech assistance, oftentimes during disaster response. So as was mentioned earlier, uh, NAPSEC has a very large network of uh, all disciplines, all levels of government and the private sector. This map is showing who's on the uh, attendee list today. This was as of Monday, we're up to about 250 now. So you could see we have the majority of the country covered, uh, but today we have a very high representation of our other sector affiliation category. That is a lot of vendor and private sector participation, obviously with the indoor frontier being so new uh, that was expected and we appreciate all of you being on the webinar today. We also understand that a lot of you are slammed with COVID related work. So thank you for making it today. NAPSIC has compiled some resources on our website for you to use. Uh, we would also like to point out that the COVID-19 tech and GIS questionnaire is still open. This is your chance to share your use of data-driven support tools and technology during the ongoing COVID-19 response and help inform how we will prepare for and respond to future pandemics. As you can see, those links are there and they will be sent out afterwards. So now that we have that out of the way, we're gonna get onto some fun stuff. 
Uh, for those of you on your phone or computer, you can go to menti.com and use the code 509857, or you could scan the QR code, uh, and this will bring you to our menti.com poll. I'll pause briefly for folks to go to that. All right, and the code will continue to be at the top of the slides going forward in case it took a little longer. So we're gonna ask folks, you know, what is the biggest challenge to your agency or jurisdiction in adopting new and emerging technology? All right, so as our word cloud continues to shift, uh, I think we all knew funding. Funding is going to come up anytime you raise the issue of biggest challenge. Um, but funding for new and emerging technology is always a challenge because it tends to be more expensive than a lot of other things out there. Um, unproven, for sure, especially in public safety. Uh, you try to give law enforcement or fire uh, a piece of technology that fails one time, they're probably not going to go back to it again. And we always see kind of the culture and attitude and leadership that's throughout the uh, responses. Of course, you know, there's people set in ways and they're, they're tried and true as we discussed before, but trying to adopt uh, new technologies is definitely a cultural shift as well. So you could keep on responding to those if you would like, uh, they will be available also afterwards. So next question is, what technology do you use in your personal life that you would like to see used by the public safety community? And now as we go through this, think about what you use every day at home, what your kids use, what your neighbors use. So we have a lot of mapping and GIS and web app responses here, absolutely. Uh, I think that uh, the use of those technologies at home and by the general public is definitely more so than first responders out there. We're starting to see that being adopted with COVID response dashboards, maps and applications. We also have some augmented reality mentioned in here um, and some a lot of mobile device applications which is definitely finally making its way into public safety. All right. The next question is, what is your familiarity with indoor technology? So we have our three bins, whether it's indoor mapping, indoor tracking, or indoor navigation products. All right, so not surprising, Aaron, a little bit on the lower end of the familiarity and mapping, I think we all know is a little more ubiquitous across public safety right now. Uh, whether it's pre-planning, exterior mapping, definitely used more often than indoor tracking or navigation products. Uh, we all use a lot of navigation products in our day-to-day -day lives, but not necessarily on the job. All right. And last question, how soon do you plan on adopting indoor mapping, tracking, or navigation technologies? Uh, 
Also, you know, not surprising. I think a lot of folks are looking at indoor mapping, tracking, navigation as something way down the road that is not yet here. I think the presentations today will show you that that's not necessarily the case uh, for some things, but obviously before it becomes commonplace amongst public safety agencies, I think a lot of people are looking at the one to two or two plus year time frame for sure. So thanks for everyone who participated in the polls. Again, the results will be made available when we send out the resources and feel free to continue to put in information throughout the presentation. So, you know, we kind of know the answers to these. If you're in the industry, we sent a uh, location-based services innovation outreach survey earlier in the year and last year, and it addressed the mapping, tracking, navigation aspects indoors. You could see that very similar to your responses today, uh, mapping is definitely more mature. Unfortunately, the majority of mapping and pre-incident planning indoors is various personnel, not dedicated people, and still generating PDF maps, paper maps, and map books. Not that there's anything wrong with that, that is just the norm. Uh, very few people view pre-planning documents during an incident via anything digitally. Most of it is a document. And then for tracking of vehicles, very evident, but not of personnel. A lot of people have AVL technology for their police and fire, maybe their road and bridge, but not necessarily for personnel once they get out of the vehicle. The majority of respondents have not experimented with indoor navigation. And the biggest thing, which everyone loves at the bottom, is the governance aspect. Most don't have official departmental policies around really any of these domains. So how do we get our arms around this problem? You know, there's big data, internet of things, smart cities, all these buzzwords and other technologies that are popping up everywhere. They all create an abundance of data. Uh, NIST, Public Safety Communications Research Division has dubbed that the information axis or the I-axis. And they really want to know the answer to how will public safety organizations utilize all of the indoor technologies and the data sources to effectively improve operations. So what do we, what do we really mean by all of these technologies out there? So, you know, we have mapping 3D point clouds using LIDAR scanning and the ability to convert CAD or building information modeling drawings into 2D and 3D maps. Um, I'm sure a lot of you on the call who are from fire and law enforcement have used the Faro scanners for crime scenes or drones for accident recreation. A lot of that started outdoors and now we're moving indoors. You know, we also have another picture of a, a LIDAR scan. How do we bring that inside? So although some of these may exist for new buildings, uh, the challenge is always addressing old infrastructure, many of which don't even have PDF floor plans. So how do these technologies help you better uh, run operations indoors? We also have wearables. Wearables can be inertial devices, cell-based tracking, Bluetooth beacons, or as Suki will cover later, ultra-wideband technologies. The future of first responder wearables can be seen on the picture on the right, and it's location tracking devices, augmented reality glasses, heads-up display helmets, and other items. You know, during the recent Public Safety Communications Research Division digital conference, uh, there's haptic feedback devices and hyper-reality helmets. And all of these things are being developed now for use by public safety in the very near future. And then the internet of things devices have a lot of promise for first responders, but they also come with security issues and lack of standardization. Can we have smart locks automatically unlock a house when a thermostat or smoke detector believes there's a fire? Can smart lights change colors and help guide responders to a call for service? Uh, at the end of this presentation, I'll briefly touch on another related project to Internet of Things information uh, being conducted by NIST. And then finally, you know, the overall smart city or overall smart home, you know, whether traffic management or asset tracking, grocery shopping or next gen 911, all these technologies we're starting to see in everyday life. So that really brings us back excuse me, to the idea of big data. You know, how can we take all this fragmented information from all these devices, do some sort of analytic function, and then improve decision-making for first responders? 
How can we identify technology that works in their operating environments while also integrating it into their current systems? So on that, we're going to walk through some of these technologies and use cases. So I'd like to introduce Phil Melke. He's the 3D web experience product manager from Esri. Phil, I believe you could take control now. Great, thank you very much, Kevin. Yep. Just gonna share my screen here. All right, as uh, Kevin mentioned, uh, my name is Philip Melke. I'm the 3D Web Experience Product Manager. And uh, at Esri, the focus there is everything having to do with Scene Viewer, uh, the JavaScript API when it comes to 3D, and then how, uh, how those scenes are consumed downstream by some of our applications. Um, I've got some examples and uh, some strategies to discuss with you. And in this case, uh, what I'd like to bring up first is a discussion around exterior modeling uh, that falls into next gen 911 requirements and potential for pre-planning, but it also helps with the process of mapping your indoors. Next, I'll discuss a couple of interior modeling methods, and then uh, I'll finish with the examples and strategies for connecting real-time data streams, which is how you'll be able to show those first responders both outside and inside um, your, your built environment. But to begin with, uh, what I'd like to first discuss is just one of the ways that we, we look at this kind of data. Uh, and LOD stands for level of detail. So when we're approaching 3D, this, this term of LOD is something that is pretty prevalent across 3D graphics so that um, the level of detail that you're showing is appropriate uh, or, or the data that you're building is appropriate for the use case that you're trying to pursue. And um, just in walking through these, uh, LOD zero is uh, not 3D, just footprints. LOD one is an example of extruded footprints, um, which is something that can be done with ArcGIS Pro or Scene Viewer. Uh, LOD two is to show appropriate roof forms. And I'll just give you a quick example with the 3D local government base map solution. LOD three is uh, roof forms and exterior uh, imagery. You can add textures in ArcGIS Pro to produce this level of detail. And then what we're all here for is ultimately the modeled interior and scanned interior, which we're able to read and publish Revit uh, BIM data and ArcGIS indoors or also some uh, interior scanning strategies. So uh, let me show you a quick example here of, uh, of one of these use cases uh, in support of next-gen uh, 911 requirements. So what we're seeing here is a scene, an application that consumes a 3D scene that has 3D buildings along with a live stream of active calls. And these calls are coming in uh, from uh, PSAP. This is a simulation in which we're able to demonstrate the placement of these calls along with location uncertainty, which is a big, uh, big importance when we're talking about responding and knowing where, um, where a caller is uh, and where they're placed within the building. We have to be able to identify the uncertainty to know um, how certain we are, which floor that they are, or where they are within the building. And uh, you know the the initial strategy I think a lot of cities are working with is that you know all of this is difficult to get the indoor data on. So the developing an exterior is something that can happen at the city and jurisdiction level. Um, just a uh, and and really these can come together in order to serve these use cases, and we can uh, we can serve these and stream these online. Uh, through the scene, uh, scene viewer technology and the 3D technology that we have in ArcGIS Online. So here we're just looking into the San Diego Convention Center with some of the indoor built environment that we have there. And essentially what we're looking at here is a floor plan with, with uh, the lines that were borrowed from CAD data of the San Diego Convention Center and extruded and visualized here so that we're able to access them uh, directly within this scene you can start to get a sense as far as how we, we are beginning to approach this problem here. Um, so just kind of starting, uh, starting simple, LOD1, extruded footprints, this is just something that you can actually do here within Scene Viewer with a configuration of being able to identify an attribute that is signifying the height, and then that will produce uh, this uh, building layer that will work for um, a city scale 
um, you know, you can style it uh, the way that you'd ultimately like to be able to see this and then use the uh, that height value in order to extrude buildings to give an impression on where within that building a call may be coming from. Again, this is simple. We're, we're starting with the basics and kind of extending over uh, to, to the indoors environment. This is scalable. This is something that can be, so for example, this Microsoft building footprints layer in ArcGIS Online we have in Living Atlas is something that can then be scaled to all of, uh, all of the, the, uh, the data set that we have uh, for, uh, for the US. And in this case, we're able to just zoom from city to city and where they have height values, we can see these extruded uh, buildings. Now, next on to that is uh, another strategy for building your 3D city. And this is exterior again. This is the, the 3D local base map, uh, local base map solution. It, it was previously called the local government base map solution. So we're able to develop these kinds of roof forms and exterior details. And I just want to show you a quick story map that we'll be able to share with you that, that just walks through essentially how this works. Two ingredients, LIDAR data and footprints, give you the ability to leverage that LIDAR in order to be able to create this 3D base map. So that we start from the ground up and use that LIDAR and classify ground so that we're able to build an accurate elevation model. We then are able to identify and extract the buildings with appropriate, appropriate roof forms based off the classification for that LIDAR. All of this can happen in ArcGIS Pro and through task-based workflows, which make this job a heck of a lot easier. Now that we've extracted those buildings, we are also um, we're able to then uh, uh, separate and segment the buildings into floors, given information that we know about that building, either square footage or um, in being able to see the outside and the number of windows and stories that we have. And also we can extract uh, schematic or realistic vegetation from that LIDAR data and go on to build a lot of other interesting things that could be a little bit more applicable for other GIS workflow, bridges, power lines, underground pipelines. And uh, one of the other components or the things that you can do with this is ultimately to create a, uh, a flood impact solution. So you can see here the example of what is impacted as, uh, as water levels may rise within an area. So again, it gives you that ability to really extract that, those features and the value to LIDAR. LIDAR is more and more prevalent and common within uh, uh, jurisdiction, cities, counties. Uh, and you know, it's typically something that is uh, approached and purchased by your GIS department. So it's worth checking to see with what kind of LIDAR is available so that you can begin your journey towards developing 3D data. All right, so uh, another thing here that I think this becomes a little bit more uh, relevant to our, our purpose here today is to understand how we can model that interior uh, uh, environment. And the first thing ultimately that I want to be able to show you here is, uh, well, uh, we were talking about scanning before with Pharaoh, and as Kevin was bring, showing that example, I found uh, this example that we had hosted in ArcGIS Online. So scanning, this is something that was at the Westchester Police Academy, uh, one of those Pharaoh scans that we were able to bring that LIDAR data in, create a point cloud scene layer in which we're able to serve that large volume of LIDAR data in, uh, for the purposes of crash scene analysis, for forensics analysis, or you, this also has purpose within, uh, within buildings as well, so that it gives you a sense of that uh, built environment and you can get an idea on where windows, doors, assets, features, furniture, uh, all the things that are, are within a building. Uh, another scanning method that we have here is the ability to develop an integrated mesh from, uh, from Matterport. And uh, just to get a sense of this example, this one kind of blows me away, is that we're able to, this exterior shell is something that was developed from drone to map, one of our products that, uh, you know, standard off the self off the shelf commercial drone, you can fly around a building or uh, an area of interest, create this, uh, this integrated 3D, integrated mesh that shows this 3D skin of the earth model. But not only is it produced that kind of skin of the earth model, but also the insides of buildings here. So here we're just looking at one of our offices and a Matterport scan inside of that. And it'll help you to give a sense of detail that is realistic, both in shape and, uh, and color and uh, really helps you to get that, that 
scan that, that concept as far as like what's inside of that building. So uh, something I was mentioning before here was also uh, we have a partnership with Autodesk that enables us to consume architectural diagrams from Revit. So if you have uh, uh, recently built buildings uh, within your uh, within your jurisdiction that you're concerned about and you uh, you want to be able to understand that mapped environment, this is something that can be consumed, uh, read in ArcGIS Pro and then published within Scene Viewer so that you can develop this level of uh, very accurate, very precise modeling. And uh, you know, we've been able to, to pull together entire campuses. Uh, this has been a, a very popular option and it's an approach that uh, you should be aware of in your positions as you're seeing some of these new buildings uh, that, especially if they're public buildings or high priority buildings, that, that uh, you know something to something to ask for can I get can I get that Revit data um, and then from there uh, it's it's a simple process to publish this into ArcGIS online so that you can use it as a base map for your informed decisions uh, about response pre-planning and any of the other public safety workflows that you may be approaching um, so uh, let's see one other thing to, to note here is our uh, commercial uh, geo-enabled system of ArcGIS indoors. So indoors is the method that we use to work with our customers that are interested in being able to uh, produce accurate facility maps that are used for a variety of use cases. Wayfinding for operations, safety and security, emergency management, for asset management, for space management, and it, it's a complete suite of software and data uh, services that are, are used to produce that 3D environment based off of, can be CAD data, BIM data, um, or it's something that can be uh, drawn and derived from any other kind of floor plans here in order to create these kinds of 3D maps that are then used for all of these use cases. Now a component of, of indoors is also the in, indoor positioning system. So um, the, just a statement, Esri doesn't produce an infrastructureless IPS. We have a variety of different methods that we bring together in order to accurately depict the environment. And as that under that use case of indoors is something that's generally developed for the purposes of um, uh, a known kind of campus environment where uh, users are moving around within that environment, uh, the we are focused on this uh, this kind of uh, IPS that requires infrastructure. And that infrastructure is BLE, um, the, the Bluetooth low emission or uh, low energy um, uh, beacons. We have uh, Wi-Fi beacons uh, and uh, GPS that collectively come together uh, in order to, uh, into the, the, our own IPS system, which is then used in order to derive, which is the most accurate, um, the most accurate stream at the time that we're receiving it so that we can place individuals indoors. Now this can have a variety of different use cases, but one of the ones that we're seeing here is actually a back to work program for COVID. So understanding all of the, uh, the areas around these desks, how far they are from, uh, from each other in order to understand this kind of placement, to collect information with collector and in, 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 in those kinds of images. And again, to then be able to display that in a 3D environment. This data can also be made useful here with, um, with our discussion around being able to use uh, tracking systems and in integrating with GeoEvent Server so that we're able to either use Esri's IPS, as is the case here, um, or to, uh, to use external IPS systems and read the, those locations into GeoEvent Server and produce real-time features to be able to see the locations of uh, individuals, guards, uh, uh, public safety responders, uh, just, just for the ability to, to immediately know uh, where they are and that can improve both the operations, the dispatching process, and ultimately give you a better picture about how the response for an incident or uh, even just pre-planning can, can take place here. 
Um, you know, we can collect incidents here so that we're able to see things like um, where, where our, our assets, our Knox boxes, and ultimately be able to, to serve those use cases that we were, we were mentioning before. So 3D is a part of the ArcGIS platform. Uh, so all, all that we were, we were showing before are examples of utilizing data that is sometimes 2D GIS information that you may have in ArcGIS Online or Enterprise already that can be symbolized as 3D, 3D data or brought in and uh, collectively shown with the, the 3D data for context. Um, ultimately, uh, some of our other products also integrate with this. So Geo Event Server, Collector, all of these things also work with 3D features. So uh, as you may have implemented some of this, it's, it's, uh, it's good to know that you can utilize these. You can bring them in to uh, be consumed by GeoEvent Server, enriching call information with things like floor address uh, or building address and floor levels or any other information that you then want to then be able to stream out and make it viewable on mobile devices uh, or MDTs. One, uh, one parting example here, uh, just as we are a platform, we do have partners in this space. This is a, a great example from Geocom where they're showing their smart venue map. This is something that they'd use for a Super Bowl and uh, uh, other, uh, other events. And you can see that they have a strategy for extruding that floor plan data into these 3D walls that help to provide that kind of context around visibility. What can cameras see ultimately what they're looking at? So, um, you know, I hope that uh, provides a useful context about the, the ArcGIS platform and the way that we're supporting 3D with indoor location technology. I think this is a, a, a great time to be able to, to hand it off um, to Suki will be discussing uh, um, their, their own IPS here. So thank you very much and be glad to answer any questions after, uh, after this portion. Thanks, Phil. And, you know, but this is in an idealized state, you know, as Phil talked about having the uh, IPS inside of a building, identifying what your critical infrastructure is beforehand is great for uh, soft targets and large campuses. But we all know that a lot of the critical incidents happen at facilities that, you know, rarely have uh, a new building information model that's already brought into a system. So uh, I'm going to hand it over now to Suki Lamba, who is the head of the track IO team, and he's going to cover uh, how we're doing this and how folks are doing it without infrastructure, kind of that infrastructure free model. All right. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Phil. And thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm going to just uh, share my screen here. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll come up uh, fairly quickly here. Uh, give me one second while I switch to the full screen mode here. All right, so um, Kevin, you are able to see the screen? Yep, everything's good. All right, sounds good. So um, so this is uh, uh, Track.io. Um, so do you guys know that uh, in the United States, there are about uh, half a million structure fires per year. They result in around 3,000 deaths. And it uh, results in, again, 10.5 billion of direct property loss. Additionally, um, about 58,000 firefighters were injured in 2018 in the line of duty. And uh, 47,000 of them were exposed to hazardous substances. Uh, besides, one of the figures which is not here is line of uh, duty deaths which hover around 100. And, uh, you know, there's been a, this number hasn't shown a decline, even if a lot of new technologies are being built to save the lives of first responders. Uh, one of the holy grail problem for firefighters and first responder is being able to locate firefighters inside buildings or in difficult areas where GPS does not work without uh, pre-deployed infrastructure. Uh, now I'm displaying some of these incidents, and you show the serious. Uh, these show the serious consequences of not having this technology here. For example, in the Massachusetts um, 
there was a firefighter who was trapped in second floor of, of an apartment building and lost his life in December of 2018. Another firefighter was trapped in an elevator. And uh, recently, in a few months ago, in Central California, in the town of uh, um, Porterville, a uh, couple of firefighters lost their lives. They lost it in a building, in a library fire, and they could not be located for many hours. These are uh, certainly some heartbreaking stories. And these also illustrate that after many decades of effort to solve this problem, there has not been an effective solution so far in this matter. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Sukhi Lamba, and um, I am um, heading a team called Track.io within NECX. The mission of my team is to solve this very challenging problem for first responders. Um, on the personal note though, I have my own motivation to solve this, which came from a, uh, an incident, a tragic incident, a little over two and a half years ago. So in fact, the time was um, two years, nine months ago exactly, in Northern California town of Santa Rosa uh, on October 9th of 2017. As a couple of these stories show, overnight in a massive wind-driven fire uh, called Tubbs Fire, we lost a large portion of the town. Overall, 5,000 houses were destroyed and we lost uh, 22 of my neighbors in that fire, along with um, you know my, myself losing my house and all the belongings. At that time, it was the biggest fire in California history. Overall, everybody was caught off guard by this massive destructive event. Uh, the firefighters from many neighboring cities and uh, mutual aid were on the scene, but locating and coordinating was a big challenge, especially in hard to reach areas and indoors. Many of my neighbors who lost their lives, they could not be located inside the house. Uh, neither the firefighters who went to save them could be located. Uh, many of them lost their lives trying to open the garage when the light was out and they could not uh, manually open it or they did not, did not know how to open it. So uh, needless to say, this event affected me deeply in a personal level. And therefore, when NECX invited me to be part of this Track.io team after that event, I readily accepted. And since then, it has been become my mission and obsession to solve this problem for first responders. Now, let me uh, give you a quick overview of NEC and NECX. Uh, NEC is an information and communication technology leader in operation for 120 years. Um, we have nine laboratories throughout the world uh, which employ around 1,000 uh, highly skilled researchers and scientists. NECX, on the other hand, was launched by NEC Corporation in Silicon Valley to fast track technologies and business ideas. Um, NECX accelerates the development of innovation products and uh, it uses the strength of NEC laboratories technologies. So the whole uh, modus operandi of NECX is to provide uh, best of both worlds. Uh, strength of well-established company on the one hand, and uh, agility of Silicon Valley startup on the other hand. Uh, as it's illustrated on the right-hand side bottom chart, technologies go through various processes of uh, discovery, validation, refinement, and robust engineering before launch in the market. Track.io is in between uh, technical refinement and engineering at this time, and we are expecting to be out in the market early part of next year. So uh, let's, let's look at why tracking personnel inside is so challenging. Uh, number one, uh, we have no access to GPS indoors or in difficult terrains. Um, number two is um, inertial uh, measurement units or IMUs, which have been generally used for this purpose, uh, they accumulate error. So they can drift drastically from time to time, uh, ultimately losing track of actual position determinations. Uh, this drift is an ever increasing difference between where the system thinks it is located and where it actually is. Uh, number three major factor uh, is for firefighters, and it's a big one, is no access to indoor infrastructures. Most, I've, most of the time, firefighters cannot rely on pre-installed hardware or positioning solutions uh, inside buildings. 
Um, number four challenge is position, position needs to be uh, in real time. So you need to have a fairly quick refresh rate uh, to be effective. So as you see, most of these uh, solutions which are existing today, um, they are positioning in a very global sense. Say for example, you are able to find uh, where a firefighter is on a particular, uh, where, uh, which floor a particular firefighter is, but the precise location is still not determined. So there is an overall gap in the location technologies and how it is done uh, indoors and outdoors as well, because outdoors you have GPS and uh, indoors and in difficult terrains, there's no GPS. So uh, with that, you know, we, when we started solving this problem, we came to actually uh, two sub problems. First is uh, safety of first responders inside the building or G GPS denied environment. Uh, other is command control and coordination of first responders mission inside. Uh, so these two problems are the major issues that firefighters face um, you know, every day. Uh, there are two documented, uh, well-documented incidents. Um, one is on the cold storage uh, fire where six firefighters were lost in the Rochester, Massachusetts. Another is uh, Brad Trevor uh, story in Arizona where he lost his life, a, a very brave firefighter. Uh, and this problem, um, you know, also um, is not helped by current methods which are used you know, specifically end of hose line method or radio. Uh, these are passive um, or these are not passive uh, devices. So, you know, they require firefighters to do something. And most of the time when firefighter is uh, there inside, they do not, uh, you know, they forget or, you know, they're in a situation there, they cannot uh, act on some things. So the ideal solution has to be passive, works automatically and uh, you know, preferably is visual for uh, incident commander to see. So uh, when NEC started working on this few years ago, you know, first solution uh, which we came up with uh, was a drone solution, uh, relied on drone and the second is without drone. And uh, both of these were infrastructure free. So let me talk about the first drone solution but uh, before that, you know, what exactly is TrackIO? So TrackIO is an on-demand and accurate indoor location solution for first responders. It works in real time and without the help of any pre-installed indoor hardware or infrastructure. So all these underlying words are important, right? It should be on-demand, very quickly set up. It should be accurate to within one to two meters. Uh, it should be real time, not much lag and uh, doesn't rely on any pre-installed infrastructure. So the first uh, solution with drone, which we came up with a few years ago, you know, when you come in um, to an to a, uh, incident, you fly the drone and then you start looking at, um, you know, your firefighters inside a particular floor. And the way that you do it is, uh, you know, through these dots on a map, for example, where you see them moving around. And uh, the underlying technology, uh, you know, relies on something called uh, trilateration. Uh, tri and uh, what it is, is, is a three points uh, for a particular node that you want to determine. Now, you know, how to trilaterate, right? Is the three static points outside? These are, uh, you know, typically not ideal because you have different heights and dynamic environment. So, Instead, we have a moving single device like a drone, which uh, flies around, uh, you know, in a multiple vantage points over time. And what it forms is something called synthetic aperture, which is the path taken, taken by the node and re records the distance between drone and each firefighter. Uh, now, the problem with the drone solution is that, um, you know, many fire departments and uh, they're not equipped to fly drones or they do not have license for the skills. So then we came up with the other solution, which is the current solution, which is infrastructure free, of course, but without the drone. And it relies on hardware and our patented uh, real-time location detection and tracking software. Each firefighter wears a beacon device and information is collected uh, from beacon device to a central controller to calculate their position. 
and they use a tablet to display the location to the site commander. Um, we combine inputs from various sensors technologies like UWB and uh, others uh, to calculate the position, uh, which is accurate to one to two meters. And we do X, Y, Z uh, location determination, which of course includes the multiple floors um, and it's in real time. So, you know, we have a very little lag, um, second or less. And uh, we also trace path for firefighters has taken. Um, and, uh, you know, additional information about hazards and search coverage and safe zones. Those are important for uh, with that tracking. So now I'm gonna play a quick video about our solution. And in the end of that video, you know, I have uh, my contact information, would be happy to answer any question um, you may have. Um, you know, you can send me an email and be happy to, uh, you know, happy to respond. So let's, uh, let's water, watch our video. One of the big problems for fire departments is not able to track firefighters inside buildings. Traditionally, the only way to get a sense of location inside is through radio. Also, not being able to rely on inside pre-installed hardware makes the problem tougher to solve. Introducing TrackIO, a unique real-time indoor location tracking solution that does not rely on pre-installed hardware. By providing real-time situational awareness, TrackIO enables more efficient coordination of a mission and greatly reduces response time, thus saving lives and property. The solution works in three-dimensional space. In addition to tracking X and Y direction on each floor, the solution can also identify which floor the firefighter is and it is displayed on graphical user interface as separate floors for tracking purposes. Each firefighter carries a small wearable tracking beacon. Firefighter can also drop additional anchors on areas of interest to tag, for example, stairs, source of fire, victims, and hazmat. And these are visible to the incident commander. If IC makes any mistake in giving direction to firefighters, he can see them going in wrong direction and quickly correct himself. In a most dreaded scenario of firefighters inside declaring Mayday, the situation gets very tricky. In the traditional sense with no visible location information, the incident commander can only rely on a reactive mode to try to find location information. However, with Track IO, the location of firefighters is always known on GUI. The commander can direct other firefighters to Mayday Firefighter. All right, so so that's uh, that's my talk, and you know reach out to me for any question. So I'll turn it over to you, Kevin, right now. Thanks, Sophie. So I will go back to... All right, so let me go ahead and make sure we're good. All right, so thanks to both of our presenters. Please put your questions in the Q&A function on Zoom and they will either get to you uh, from now until the end or we'll pause at the very end to answer any question. So um, again, I want to talk through the best practices guide real quick. Um, you know, one of the most critical aspects of these emerging technologies is ensuring that it's designed for first responders. Uh, in this vein, we're developing a best practices guide for indoor mapping, tracking, navigation to help not only local programs learn some of the areas necessary for the successful implementation uh, but also for the products and vendor creators so they know what people are actually looking for. So the ultimate goal is to really address this diffusion of innovation curve. You know, typically, first responders don't have the budget or the time to fall into that innovator category, and very few can call them actually early adopters. It's the same struggle. But if we wait around to reach that early and late majority stages, years will have passed since these technologies have been used in the you know, general community. 
Uh, much like COVID, it's funny enough, we're trying to flatten this curve that you see here. We're trying to get more folks over towards the innovators and early adopter side. So what does the guide cover? As we mentioned earlier, the innovation outreach survey helped to identify the gaps and priorities moving forward. There's also a location-based services first responder working group uh, that is made up of local first responder agencies, the private sector, NAPSIG staff, and NIST representatives that helped guide the overall outline. And the guide is broken up into the distinct mapping, tracking, and navigation sections. You could kind of see the table of contents for each one here. So for mapping, you know, we're taking the principles that have been used for outdoor mapping and ensuring they meet the needs of the indoor environment. As much as a symbol and attribute to represent points are important, really the coordinates and the accuracy become a lot more critical indoors. Outdoor environments, you can see a parking lot or a main entrance or an ingress and egress route, whereas the difference in a few feet indoors can be a separate floor, a hallway, a separate office. For those of you that are tied in with NextGen 911 um, and all of the Z-axis projects out there, the FCC has both X and Y and Z coordinate uh, accuracy reports out there right now. For tracking, it's not as mature as the mapping of indoor environments. And there's a whole host of other issues. Uh, tracking responders indoors depends on connectivity and accuracy, an interval level that allows for accurate reporting of positions. There's also governance and security privacy concerns with first responders. We also have terminology issues. When tracking, do we mean the last known point? Where was Bob five minutes ago? Or do we mean a track log and breadcrumbs to show where the first responder has been? There's obviously use cases for both. For example, uh, showing where responders have been with the track log can help clear buildings faster during a heavy law enforcement response. Uh, whereas last known point is really helpful during a May day or officer down. The overwhelming feedback we've received so far is that the infrastructure free is going to be the preferred method in the future. But obviously we have to get there. It's going to be a hybrid of static infrastructure and infrastructure free. And then navigation. Obviously, we want to navigate folks just like we do to a scene or to a call for service. Um, whether navigation is built into heads up displays or smartphones or radios using haptic feedback, it should be just as familiar indoors as it is outdoors. So if you want to know more about this project, you could visit the IXS website link found here. We have a sandbox environment for indoor pre-planning, resources, and all the materials from previous first responder working group meetings, and more. Uh, if you scan this QR code, it will bring you to a sandbox to test for pre-planned features for fire. Uh, on the website, you can also find the most recent draft of the best practices guide. We're targeting the end of this year for a version one release, and in the meantime, we welcome any submissions for new best practices or revisions. So of course, we just scratched the surface of the indoor frontier today. So we wanted to leave you with some additional resources. You could see not only the IAXIS website, but also the public safety accelerator program that NIST runs. Uh, both Track IO and Esri 3D GIS can be found. And I wanted to take a brief second to highlight the Internet of Things and Environments project by Allison Kane from NIST PSCR, which is trying to I identify the data that sensor systems must be able to provide first responders, and then how the first responder community can help inform technology developers to create the product's public safety needs. That link at the bottom will bring you to her presentation from the Public Safety Communications Research Division 2020 conference. And finally, what's next? We wanted to let you know about other events that NAPSIC is hosting. Uh, the Open Community Forum for COVID Technology and GIS Hotwash will take place on August 25th. This is part two of the webinar exploring how technology and data-driven resource, data-driven decision tools are being used in the fight against COVID. And on August 27th, the EMGO Forum will cover wildfires, the resources available to GIS and emergency management staff, and how you can utilize new technologies to gain better situational awareness. Some topics are FEMA's regional response to wildfire incidents, an overview of the National Interagency Fire Center and other services, and we'll show you how local GIS staff can utilize national level feeds. 
With that, we will answer some questions for Q&A. Uh, Paul, do we have any outstanding questions? Yeah, we've got about five questions. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think they're all directed at Suki. Um, and uh, yeah. it looks like... I can answer. Um, Go for it. I can answer uh, some of these here. Um, so um, question regarding the cost, um, you know, we don't have the cost uh, determined yet, but I would recommend you to connect with me uh, through email and we can discuss about it uh, further. So um, the next question is, uh, have, we, have you done beta testing in multi-story buildings? Yes, uh, the answer is yes, we have done and we continue to do it. And if you are interested in uh, beta testing, I would recommend you to connect with me and we would be happy to, you know, talk about that. Um, okay, let me see what is the next one. Is NECX an ESRI partner? Is Track.io easy to integrate with uh, RTGIS? So, you know, we are not, not currently ESRI partner, but we are open to integration with others. And, um, you know, actually I was talking to um, our ESRI representative here and we would be happy to talk to them uh, afterwards. Uh, so, so that is our, our position on integration. Um, let me see if there is anything else I missed. Um, what happens if a single person detached from the group? How is he positioned? Uh, so we have, you know, uh, multitudes of technologies that we use um, and we, we can connect with that person through, uh, through different uh, sensors. Um, and, uh, you know, person, uh, there, there's a, you know, network of uh, uh, kind of a system that we form and we try to connect through different, uh, different folks in the, in the technology. So we can uh, discuss further. So I would recommend again, um, we you reach out to me. There's one of the technologies I am you dead reckoning we use, uh, but um, please uh, reach out to me and I can discuss uh, further with my team. Um, is there anything else you guys see which I haven't responded? I can do. It's like Mickey is raising his hand. Let's see if I can find that. Mickey, I'm not sure if we can allow uh, attendees to chat. So if you want to put your question in the Q&A function. Um, we also have from Michael uh, asking which cities we feel are the best examples of having incorporated IPS throughout government buildings. Phil, are you aware of any? Well, uh more so on the modeling front. So uh, just to just to be aware, uh, the U.S. is a little bit behind as far as like indoor 3D modeling and the development of uh, BIM data to be used for public safety purposes. Uh, in Europe, there are requirements uh, to actually keep BIM data on file and to be able to refer to them. And that's either new buildings with Revit data or also uh, Paris, they're prioritizing the scanning of older buildings, a scan to BIM process where they go through with LIDAR and then draw the interiors of those buildings, digitize and develop a 3D, uh, 3D interior model. So I think uh, the, in this case, uh, because of the lack of requirements around BIM data in the US, we're, we're uh, a bit behind compared to what you, you'll find in uh, places like Paris, Berlin and, and other European cities. Great, thanks. Um, and then there was just one other comment in the chat I wanted to address uh, before we sign off. So there was a comment about the indoor systems making it look like the floor plans kind of already exist. Um, that's a great point. And throughout the best practices guide, we, we make sure it's known that this is kind of a layered approach. Um, you have to build out the floor plans first. I don't think any of the applications out there that will track and navigate first responders magically have uh, both 2D and 3D floor plans. I think people are starting to use a lot more open source resources out there to either convert from PDF or to scan buildings that they determine are soft targets or critical infrastructure. Uh, but absolutely, I think these are different solutions that require 
a map to start with. And then on top of that, you can layer a, a navigation or a tracking aspect. So uh, great yep. point there. Yeah, Kevin, I, I agree with you. And, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, sort of uh, be, being an example of producing some of these demonstrations, there's a, there's a lift that's involved with this and it's not one to take. Uh, it's, it's not one to, uh, to not resource appropriately. Uh, in a lot of cases with, with these buildings, it's frequently on the uh, building owners to produce these indoor maps. And it's, we found that it's usually the case that this happens uh, for other reasons, facilities management or whatnot. So, um, you know, just keep in mind that it takes a, a strategy of sharing with um, building owners in your jurisdiction. Absolutely. All right. So, uh, again, out of respect to everyone's time, we appreciate everyone taking the time to join us today. Uh, Kevin, thanks again. Uh, well, oh, go one, ahead. One quick clarification to the earlier uh, question. I want to make sure that, uh, you know, with respect to integration, um, I just want to mention that TrackIO definitely, um, you know, integrates with PDF maps uh, on our GUI. So if you have, a, for example, building maps and others, you know, we can take that information. And uh, Great. so thank you. Uh, yep. Thanks. So again, thanks to uh, Philip and Suki for presenting today and uh, NIST PSCR for their support from the Public Safety Innovation Accelerator Program. Uh, everyone will receive an email in a couple of days with the resources from this webinar. So whether it was our survey or some of the poll questions, our presenter contact information or demos that will all be included in that. And as always, feel free to reach out to NAPSIG or any of the presenters at any point. So um, with that, thanks everyone again for joining us and have a good evening.